Everybody, good morning. If you will stand with me, take your song books, page 282, the little chorus, The Family of God. We'll sing it through, through two times, page 282. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. A joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sun. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad. Pages, page number 270. Wonderful words of life. We'll do all three verses. Page 270. Amen. All right, you can be seated this morning, and we do greet you and welcome you to our morning worship service here at Parkwood Baptist Church. Uh, if you are a visitor, especially a first-time visitor, we are certainly grateful that you are here, and uh, we ask that you would take the connection card that's in the seat back in front of you or close beside you, and fill that out and put it in the offering plate when we pass those momentarily, and uh, we would love to be able to connect with you and reach back out and thank you for coming. And we've got a gift. If you're a first-time visitor, we've got a gift to give you you'll see me after the service. Let me make a few announcements and we'll move forward into, uh, into the worship service this morning. Uh, beginning this week, May the 2nd, Thursday, May the 2nd, ladies, 
Uh, this is the first, you'll have the first of six uh, Bible studies. These are weekly Bible studies here at the church at 930 in the morning. And so a little different format than, than uh, the monthly Bible studies. But if you uh, want to attend the weekly Bible studies, ladies, Thursday will be it's a six-week study beginning this Thursday, every Thursday between now uh, and June the 6th, I believe, is that date. Uh, at 9.30 a.m. here at the church, and so keep that in mind. Books will be handed out during, uh, during that first meeting. They've been ordered. If you have any questions, see Ms. Lou Ann Shepard about that. Um, not this coming Wednesday night, but a week from this coming Wednesday night on May the 8th, where the Kevin Vargas will be preaching in our absence. We will, uh, Lori and the boys and I will be in Lynchburg, Virginia for graduation, and, uh, and so pray for Brother Kevin. And uh, he'll do an excellent job, as always, of, uh, of feeding you spiritually and giving, bringing God's Word that evening. Uh, Mother's Day is coming up on May the 12th, and so keep that in mind. Um, we will have normal morning services, Sunday school, 10, worship at 11, but no evening services on Mother's Day. And so uh, keep that in mind. We, we always dismiss the evening service, give you an opportunity to spend some time uh, with your family on that Sunday uh, May the 12th. Um, all right, uh, if you signed up to be on a mowing crew, uh, men, if you're on a mowing crew and you didn't get this Wednesday night, on, on the bulletin table out there, there's, uh, there's this sheet of paper. It will let you know what mowing crew you're on and, uh, and then the dates that you are responsible for mowing, uh, your crew is responsible for mowing the church. And, uh, and so keep that in mind. Now, if you have any questions, uh, depending on what crew you're on, there'll be an asterisk beside an individual's name. Ask them. Uh, that's your, your mowing crew leader. And so you can ask them any questions that you have about that. But, man, make sure you grab that. And if there's not enough, we can certainly print more of those. All right. I don't know of any other announcements. Um, we do have some birthdays. Ryan Smith has a birthday. He turns five years old tomorrow. Is that right? Five tomorrow. Ryan's a little under the weather this morning, but, uh, but we certainly wish Ryan a happy birthday. Miss Nadine has a birthday tomorrow as well. Uh, happy birthday to Miss Nadine. And then I see Brother Bobby Doucet has a birthday this week on the 2nd. So happy birthday, my friend. Happy birthday. All right, Brother Ken, let's see. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Stand with me if you will, song, uh, page number 294, get your songbooks. We'll do all three verses of Set My Soul Afire, page 294. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me, let thy voice be heard. A million strove in darkness in this day and hour.
Revive us again, all four verses, 295. ushers will come at this time we will take our morning tithes and offerings so if you've been asked to be an usher why don't you come forth at this time and we'll pass the plates i trust that you will give as god has prospered you in accordance to his word you'll be faithful in your giving and certainly god is always faithful to us amen bob beasley pray for us and ask the lord to bless the offering if you would
can turn the tides and calm the angry sea. He alone decides who writes a symphony. He lights every storm that makes our darkness bright. He keeps watch all through each long and lonely night. He still finds the time to hear a child's first prayer. Saint our sinner call and always find him there. Though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, I forgive. He can grant a wish or make a dream come true. He can paint the clouds and turn the gray to blue. He alone knows where to find the rainbows in. He alone can see what lies beyond the bend. He can touch a tree and turn the leaves to gold. He knows every lie that you and I have told. Though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, I forgive. He still finds the time to hear a child's first prayer. Saying our sinner call and always find him there. Though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, for that. Thank you, Miss Joni, for joining him in that special. And certainly that will, that will go along real well with our message this morning in Jonah chapter number 2. If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jonah chapter number 2, I told you last week if you have a hard time finding it, just go to the book of Obadiah and Jonah is right there. And if you can't do that, then go to the table of contents and uh, you'll find the book of Jonah listed. Jonah chapter number 2, we're walking through the story of Jonah on Sunday mornings. This will be a very short series, there are only 48 verses in the entire book, and, uh, and so this will certainly not take us very long, just a little over a month. But just in case you weren't here last week, let me sort of catch you up to speed. God speaks to his prophet, Jonah, to go to Nineveh. Jonah despises, hates the Ninevites. God says, go, and in reality, Jonah said no. And he ran literally in the opposite direction. If you still got that map handy, Ben, put it on there, and you'll get an idea of the running of Jonah from where he was to where he was supposed to go and where he went. Uh, Jonah's really having a bad moment. You, you could take it down now. He's, he's quitting on God. He's, he's literally giving up. Uh, in this moment in chapter 1, his calling as a prophet, and he's leaving town. I mentioned last Sunday that, that uh, every day that you and I live, we have a choice to either go to Nineveh or to Tarshish. Some of us are on the run, aren't we? We don't want to obey God. Uh, we, we know what the Bible says about dating an unbeliever, but we don't want to let go, and so we run. We know that uh, that, that habit in our life is destructive, but we don't want to give it up, and so we run. We know we need to get serious about our faith uh, and start serving God, but we 
have different priorities and we don't want to change that and and so we run well Jonah does that Jonah gets on a boat with pagan sailors who end up calling on him to pray when the storm gets bad enough as a matter of fact the captain wakes Jonah up the storm doesn't awaken his soul to the Lord the captain does Jonah makes a statement and he says listen if you want the storm to cease just throw me overboard and it will stop it almost seems like a noble statement from Jonah, a heroic statement, but it's really not. He does stop running at this point, but he does not start repenting. What Jonah is saying is, I'd rather just go ahead and die than be obedient to the will of God in my life. Now, the question for you and I is this, does God give up on Jonah? Certainly he does not. He goes to phase two of his plan. He's going to send Jonah a personal one-seat taxi in the stomach of a whale. Notice what the Bible says in verse 17 of Jonah chapter number one. The Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days three nights. Now I said a whale. Here's the thing. We really don't necessarily know what kind of fish this was. We talk about Jonah and the whale, but we, we don't know for sure. Uh, it could have been, but the text doesn't say that. Now Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse number 40, Jesus called it a whale, but the Greek text behind the word just simply means a large fish. Th th there are only two things we know about this fish for sure. Only two. It was huge, and it was prepared. The word prepared in the text means appointed, means arranged. In other words, God is letting us know that this is not accidental. This is not a lucky fish getting a meal out of nowhere. No, no, no. God told him what to do, and God told this fish when to do it. Just like God created a storm to get his attention, now God creates this, this big fish to capture his body. This fish was created by God, specifically for this purpose, God tells this fish, look, here is your assignment. Listen carefully. Swallow that runaway man of God, but don't chew. Now, let me ask you a question. I asked it last week. Is this story hard for you to believe? I mean, do you have a hard time believing that God literally created a fish, swallowed a man, kept him alive for three days? I have no problem believing that myself. I told you last week that if I were to list you know, the top 10 craziest miracles in the Bible. This isn't even in the top 10, in my opinion. Um, I, I don't think we should have one, one bit of trouble believing this story. When you think about it this way, we as humans have created the ability uh, to, to create a submarine where, where many people can go undersea and live for weeks at a time, but yet God creating a special fish to swallow a man for three days. Now, we, we can't buy into that. Um, that, that's a little arrogant, wouldn't you say? Th this is a prepared fish. God prepared, he appointed this fish, and, and really I think it's one of a kind. I like this story that one of our members told me last Sunday on the way out. He uh, shared with me of a godly young lady who went off to college, and secular college, and she was taking a class on religious literature, and one day they were discussing the Bible, and the professor, who was a liberal Bible skeptic, he asked if there was anyone in the class who believed the story of Jonah and the whale. And this brave teenager raised her hand and said, I, said, I believe it. And the professor looked at her with a very incredulous tone and, and said, you really believe that a man was swallowed by a big fish, stayed in the belly for three days, then was, was vomited out of that fish's mouth, landed on dry land. He lived to tell about it, wrote a book about it. You really believe that? She said, I, I absolutely believe that. He said, well, can you tell me what kind of fish it was that swallowed Jonah? And she said, no, sir, I really don't know. But I'll tell you what I'll do. When I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And the professor, with a smirk on his face, said, well, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? She smiled, and she said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> you say, Pastor, does a person have to believe that this story is a literal story in order to go to heaven? Is that a prerequisite? No, I'm not saying that. The only way to go to heaven is to trust Jesus Christ and his substitutionary death on the cross for our sin. And so the only way not to go to heaven is to reject Jesus Christ. 
to reject his love and his mercy and his grace. Receive Jesus, get to heaven. Reject Jesus, miss heaven. But listen, why would we not want to believe something that Jesus himself clearly believed? Did you know that Jesus believed that Jonah was a real person swallowed by a real fish? Did you know that? Jesus said, listen to Matthew chapter 12. You ought to write it down for reference. Matthew 12, 40 and 41. Jesus said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus believed that, that Jonah was a real man, swallowed by a real fish, got spit out after three days, then preached to a real city called Nineveh that experienced a real revival. Now think about it. If you can believe that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead three days after he died, then why in the world would you have trouble believing that a man could survive in the belly of a fish for three days and be spit out on dry land? Amen. And so for three days, God gives Jonah his own personal prayer room. It really gives a whole new meaning to the inside story, doesn't it? Uh, let me ask you a question. Would you say that in this moment, Jonah's hit rock bottom? I, I don't know that he can get any lower than, than what he's, where he's at. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in the stomach of this huge fish? Listen to how one commentator described it. He, he said, he described what it would have been like for Jonah in the belly of this fish. He said, pitch black. Sloshing gastric juices washing over you, burning the skin, the eyes, the throat, and the nostrils. Oxygen is scarce, and each frantic gulf, gulp of air is saturated with salt water. The rancid smell of digested food causes you to throw up repeatedly until you only have dry heaves left. Everything you touch has the slimy feel of the mucous membrane that lines the stomach. You feel claustrophobic. With every turn and dive of the great fish, you slip and slide in a cesspool of, of uh, digestive fluid that bleaches your body and strips all of your hair. There are no footholds, no blankets to keep you warm from the cold of the clammy depths of the sea. For three days and for three nights, you endure this harsh womb of God's grace. You get the picture? I, I think it's safe to say that Jonah has hit rock bottom at this point. The question that we have to see this morning is how does Jonah respond to that? Well, let's read chapter 2 in its entirety and we'll break it down. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heard my voice for thou hast Cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows, and waves passed over me. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight, yet I'll look again toward uh, thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down. You ought know to underline that. I went down to the bottom of the mountains and the earth. With her bars was about me forever. Yet, as thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I'll pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. The point I want to drive home this morning is this. The belly of a fish was not a happy place to live, but it was a really good place to learn, a really good place to learn. And there are going to be times in your life and in mine when we get ourselves in a well of a problem. And when you find yourself in a well of a problem, probably won't be a very happy place to live. But it can be a really good place to learn. What did Jonah learn when he was literally in this well of a problem? You and I can learn as well. Four things this morning. First of all, 
uh, when, when you hit rock bottom like Jonah, when you find yourself in a big problem, number one, you need to wake up. What I mean by that is you need to realize that God is not done with you. Man. Verse 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep. In the midst of the seas and the floods come past me about all thy billows and waves passed me over. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. You notice Jonah here. Who did Jonah say threw him into the sea? He says, God did. Thou, you, you did this. Jonah understands what's going on. He understands that his rebellion is being disciplined by God. But right here, he not only thinks he's going down, right here, Jonah thinks he's done. It's over. Uh, when Jonah got thrown overboard, the fish didn't jump out of the water and swallow him immediately. No, no, no. God let him continue to fall. You remember last week I made this statement that, that every step away from God that Jonah took was a step down. He went down to Joppa, the Bible says. He went down to the port. He went down into the boat. The sailors threw him down into the sea. And now Jonah says that he is sinking down in the depths of of the water. Every step away from God in your life is a step that is potentially taking you down. Jonah thinks he's going to die as he is descending into the dark water. And it's so black down in the water. He says, I've been, I've been, I've been cast out of your sight. Jonah feels so rotten about himself and so far from God that he's thinking that God's done with me, that it's over. Even if I survive the ministry that God has given me, the calling that God has given me, it's over with. Maybe you've felt like that. Maybe I'm speaking to someone this morning and you feel like that, that, that you have gotten so far from God, so, so far from being a godly person, so far from living a godly life, that you feel like you're literally living in darkness. Maybe you feel banished from God's sight. Maybe, maybe you have a hard time hearing and heeding the voice of God. Listen to me very carefully this morning. Jonah was wrong. He was wrong in his thinking. Yes, he's in probably the darkest spot he's ever been, but just because he can't see God does not mean that God does not see him. God knows where he's at. Is God done with Jonah? If God was done with Jonah, God would have sent jaws to eat him, not a big fish to swallow him. God is not done with Jonah, not even close. God's got his eyes and his hand upon Jonah the whole time. Now, there's a story that, that immediately comes to my mind when I think about this, a New Testament story that reminds me of this. You remember how badly Peter failed the Lord when he denied Jesus Christ? Peter, who, who, uh, who stood up at the Last Supper when the Lord said that, that all of you, you're going to betray me, and Peter said, Lord, I have no doubt these other other guys will, but, but not me. Lord, I won't betray you. I'll never deny you. He said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison for you. If need be, Lord, I'll die for you. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Peter, he said, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, won't happen, Lord. Uh, you ain't been wrong yet, Lord, but you're wrong about this one. But we know the story. When Jesus got to the greatest hour of need and his his earthly life, he's being arrested and abused. They begin to ask Peter, aren't you, aren't you one of them? Oh, no, 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 not me. I'm not one of his disciples. One man said, surely you are. I hear it in your, your Galilean accent. It gives you away. And he said, no, 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 I don't even know the man. They asked him again the third time, and he cursed, and he swore. He said, I don't know the man. Of course, at that time, the cock crowed, and Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Peter, the Bible says, wept bitterly and ran away. His heart was so, so pierced all the way through. He's at the very depths of despair because of what he had done. Of course, Jesus would then go to Calvary. He would die. He would be buried. I'm sure Peter felt more guilt than anybody in the world at that moment. Do you remember what happened when Jesus rose from the dead? The, woman, the women went to the tomb, and, and there was an angel there at the tomb, and the angel said, He's not here, for he is risen. Mark chapter number 16, I think it's verse 7, the angel uh, tells these, these women, said, go and tell his disciples, and specifically, make sure you tell Peter. Jesus is going before you into Galilee. You'll see him there, just like he said to you. Make sure Peter gets that message. Go tell Peter, God's not done with him. Your failure does not mean you're finished. 
say, well, Pastor, you have no clue what I've done. I've denied the Lord Jesus Christ. I've lived a wicked lifestyle. I've made this mistake and that mistake. Well, so did Peter. And God forgave him, and, and God used him. But, Pastor, I've run from Jesus. I've been doing my own thing for a long time. Well, welcome to the Jonah Club. Welcome. God forgave him and used him. God has not given up on you. God is not done with you. God is ready to use you. And so when you have got yourself into a, a well of a problem, remember, God's not given up on you. Wake up. Wake up. Here's the second thing. Speak up. And pray for God to help you. Notice in verse number 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord as God out of the fish's belly. Verse 2, he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heard my voice. Now it's interesting that we don't see Jonah pray until now. He doesn't pray about whether or not he should go to Nineveh. He doesn't pray when the storm is raging. He didn't pray when they threw him into the water. It's not until he's completely confined into the belly of this fish that he thinks, you know, I probably ought to pray. And I think that's a pretty good indication for you and I that it's hard to pray when you're on the run. It's hard. It's hard to pray when you're being disobedient. Maybe you find prayer difficult in your life right now. You ought to check what direction you're running. Are you running to God or are you running from God? I heard a story about a deacon who was just on fire for the Lord. And he would sit on the front pew of the church and, and uh, he would amen everything the pastor said. Amen, but amen, that's good, amen. And he would encourage the pastor. He'd just really get fired up because, man, he loved the Lord. He was on fire for the Lord. He just amened everything the pastor said. But seemingly out of nowhere, he stopped sitting on the front row. Quit saying amen. He had some sin in his life that he was holding on to, and he wouldn't get rid of it. And the preacher had no idea what was going on in his life, and so he pulled him aside one day. He said, he said, brother, he said, I notice that you don't say amen anymore like you used to. Don't you know that saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him to a pit bull? And the man said, yeah, I do know. I do. He said, pastor, it's pretty hard to say sick him to a pit bull when the pit bull has got you by the throat. And how true it is. Jo Jonah found it hard to pray when he's running from God, but God captured his attention, and now suddenly Jonah's found his voice. And he begins to cry out. He says, in my distress I called to the Lord. I told you before, many times before, that we do our best praying most of the time when we're in pain, when we're hurting. Uh, we, we don't pray when we see the light. Oftentimes we pray when we feel the heat. Jonah says, it was in my distress that I called to the Lord. The word distress there is an interesting word in the Hebrew text. It's a word in, in Hebrew that's used when a woman is giving birth. Ladies, you, 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 you will know if you've had a child, the, the agony and the pain that, and the distress that comes with labor. Men, husbands that have been there in the room, then, then you know because you, you hear the, 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 the shouts, the scream, the crying. It's not pleasant. Jonah says, that's Jonah in this huge fish. He's in the belly of this fish, and he's using a pregnancy word. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? In my distress, in my agony, at my lowest moment, I called unto the Lord, and guess what? He answered me. Now, I believe with all of my heart that God would have preferred Jonah to pray on the bow of the boat. But he listened just the same in the belly of the fish. I say that to say this, I don't care how far you've run. It makes me no difference how, how deep you've sunk. I don't care how sinful you've been or how disobedient you've gotten. If you will repent, truly repent of your ways, you are not so far from God that he will not hear you, that he will not accept that repentance and, and, and forgive you. Matter of fact, Jonah says that he's calling from the belly of hell. In other words, he's saying, I'm as far from God as I can possibly get. I I'm miserable. I'm in pain. I can't move. I can't contribute. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. I'm desperate. Jonah says, I feel like I'm in hell. Maybe that's you. 
Maybe that you maybe you're in a situation at work that feels like that. Maybe you have a state of depression that feels like that. Maybe you're in a marriage and in the state of your marriage feels like that. Maybe you're you're entangled in a certain lifestyle that feels like that, that you are so far away from God. I am telling you that you are not so far away from God that He won't hear you if you'll pray and repent. Amen. Jeremiah thirty two, seventeen says, and I love this verse, it says, O Lord God, behold. Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and thy stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Friend, you get yourself in a, in a problem. When you've hit rock bottom, wake up. Realize God's not done with you. Speak up. Pray to God. Ask him to help you. And here's the third thing. Look up. Walk by faith, not by feelings. You know, something happens to Jonah's heart. He begins to repent. He begins to pray. And you know what happens? Faith starts to grow. When he starts doing right, his faith starts to take over. His faith is going to take over where there was previously fear. Notice in verse 4, Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. Yet I'll look again toward the holy temple. Jonah saying, God, I feel like I have been banished out of your sight. God, I feel like I'm a million miles away. I feel like you couldn't hear me where I am. And yet, I'll look by faith. I'll walk by faith. I'll look again toward your holy temple. He says it again in verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thy holy temple. I feel like slipping away. My life is slipping away. I feel like I'm dying, and yet I'm going to focus on you, Lord. I am praying toward your holy temple. What does that mean? Why, why does Jonah keep referring to the holy temple, looking toward and praying toward the holy, the, the temple of God? Well, he's quoting Scripture. You ought to write this down. At least seven times he quotes the Psalms in this prayer. I would put that in your notes. You know what's happening? When Jonah's heart is squeezed to the max, what's in it starts coming out. And you know what's in this prophet's heart? Scripture, the Word of God. He begins to pray in faith by quoting the Scripture. And so what is the holy temple thing that keeps coming up in our text that he's referring to? Well, King Solomon, about 200 years before this, when he dedicated the temple, he prayed... And, uh, boy, God answered his prayer, and really God just put a big exclamation point on his prayer. And one of the things in Solomon's prayer was this, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, Lord, when your people sin against you, and, Lord, when they move away from you, and they don't do what you want them to do, when they're disobedient, Lord, when they look to you and they look to this temple, when they come back, Lord, forgive them, act on their behalf, Work mightily on their behalf when they look to your holy temple. And you know what God said to that prayer? God said, amen, sure, yes, I'll do that. And Jonah knew that. And Jonah said, even though I feel so, so far away and so, so banished, so cut off, by faith, Lord, I'm looking toward your temple. Lord, I'm looking to you. Lord, I'm trusting you. Lord, I am believing you that you'll forgive me. And of course, we know the New Testament says in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I wonder, do you believe that this morning? If you'll confess your sin and repent of your sin, God will forgive your sin. Your feelings are going to say it's not possible. You've gone too far. What are you going to listen to, faith or feelings? And notice verse 8. Here's how he says it. This is my version. I'm going to paraphrase it. You can follow along. He says, those who, who hold on to, who cling to worthless idols. And notice, what, what do they do? They turn away from, from God's love for them. The word forsake is used in the text. It means to forfeit. They forfeit God's love. God's love there in the Hebrew language is the word hesed. It's used just a few places in the Bible. This is one of them. It means loving kindness or grace. Very literally, it means the, the pursuing love of God. Those who cling to the dumb things, the, 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 the worthless things of this world that really don't matter. Jonah says that they're, they're turning away from God's love. 
those who cling, they hold on to worthless idols. What, what, were, what were the things Jonah's holding on to? Well, number one, prejudice. I don't like these people. I hate the Ninevites. Second, he, he's, he's holding on to the idol of himself. In other words, I heard God, but I really don't care what, what God said. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's a big problem in the modern day church. If I, uh, l- let me just say this. If there, is, if there is one thing that you and I as Christians need to surrender to, it's the idol of self. In my opinion, if, if there's one thing that the believers that, that I know in cultural Christian American church needs to do, it's let go of self today. You find yourself in a well of a problem. Wake up. Speak up. Look up. Lastly, fire up. Resubmit yourself to the Lord's will. Something's happening to Jonah. He's praying. He's quoting Scripture. He's believing God. His heart is coming alive. He's getting fired up, you might say. He says, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Now, we know the rest of the story. Was Jonah totally on track? No. No, not totally. Does he still have some issues? You better know he does. But aren't you glad? What is encouraging to me? Listen to what I'm about to ask you. Aren't you glad that God doesn't wait for you and I to have it totally together before he decides to use us again? You know, if God waited until our hearts were totally perfect, until our hearts were totally right, then he would never use any of us. He couldn't. Notice verse 9, but I'll sacrifice unto thee. With a voice of thanksgiving, I'll pay that that I have vowed. Salvations of the Lord. Who is this guy? It's an amazing turnaround from chapter 1. You know what he's doing? He's saying, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, I am yours Lord, I'm ready to follow your will. And notice what happens next. Verse 10, the Lord, Lord spake to the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I'm sure the fish, it's a good day in the fish's life, I'm sure. Good riddance. You probably tasted terrible, Jonah. When Jonah submitted to God's will, God got him back on track. You know what God's will is today? God's will for you is thanksgiving. The voice of thanksgiving. Jonah is worshiping in a whale. He's worshiping in a big fish. Don't wait to get out of your plight. Don't wait until your problem is fixed before you start worshiping the Lord. Worship now. The Bible says rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. God's will for you is thanksgiving. God's will for you is obedience. Jonah says, I will pay that that I have vowed. In other words, I'm your prophet, God. I go, I do, I say, and I'll be whatever you want. I have vowed to do that, Lord. I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to be obedient to you. And boy, as a child of God, if you're saved this morning, you too have vowed to submit and follow the Lord no matter what. Are you doing that? Will you do that? God's will for you is thanksgiving, obedience, it's dependence. Jonah says salvation is of the Lord, literally deliverance is of, it's from God. In other words, Jonah is saying, God, you you know that I can't get out of here. There's no way. Lord, there's no way I can get out of here by myself. If I'm going to get out of the belly of this fish, Lord, you're going to have to do it. Lord, I am dependent upon you. You ever been in a situation where your mind said the same thing, where your heart cried the same thing. Lord, there's no light at the end of this tunnel. It's getting worse. And Lord, if I'm I'm going to survive this situation, if I'm going to move forward past this situation, Lord, I am dependent upon you. Stop trusting yourself. Stop trusting your power. Stop trusting your intellect. Stop trusting your education. Stop trusting your strength. Submit to God, thank Him for who He is, obey Him in whatever He says, and depend upon Him for all things. I read a true story about a man who, uh, who bought a motor home, and he was, he was camping with his family one night, and in the middle of the night they were asleep, he heard a noise outside, he stuck his head out of the door, and there was a thief outside trying to siphon gas out of the motorhome. Well, the man, just in natural reaction, he shot out the door only to find that the thief was a 
14-year-old boy holding his stomach. He was doubled over, throwing up violently. Turns out the boy was trying to siphon gas, but he put the hose in the wrong hole. He was siphoning the sewage tank. Man calls the police. They hear the story. The owner of the motorhome decided, I'm not going to press charges. The kid has suffered enough natural consequences. It's enough. Jonah, like the boy, made a bad decision. He paid for it. Some serious consequences. But aren't you thankful this morning for the grace of God, the patience, the long-suffering of God? He got Jonah on track. He forgave Jonah. You'll see in the next week or two how God is going to use Jonah mightily. I wonder if there's someone here this morning, and you need to turn around. You need to come back to the Lord today. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Brother Ken, you come. Maybe you're running from the Lord this morning. I don't know. I don't know. And you know it. You know it. If so, you know you're not in bad company. And you've got a great story in front of you. show you how God forgives and God still uses and God still blesses. Your story's not over until God says your story's over. And as long as you've got breath in your lungs, God is willing and able to use you. But you've got to repent. You've got to take that step. It was Jonah who said, I will call unto the Lord. And when he did, things started happening in his life. Would you do that today? Would you do that? Father, I pray that you'd bless your word this morning. And that you'd speak to hearts. To that one that's running from you. I pray you'd convict them. Father, if they'll repent, I pray that you'll use them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. What number there, Brother Ken? Three.